Morning, people. Lovely to see, lovely to be in a room with people. Yeah. The true star, of course, is sitting to my left, and that's Kenton Allen, who is one of the true big beasts of television. He's... Overweight. <laughs> I meant that in a positive way. He currently owns uh, prime time on BBC One on Monday nights with two of his shows back to back. He is made. He, he is the most garlanded BAFTA winner for comedy. He works with some of the most talented uh, writers, presenters. Uh, you could wish to me. What Kenton doesn't know about telly isn't worth knowing. So we shall uh, see. So we shall see. Yeah. So we'll take questions as we go. Um, I'll ask you to wave because I've got lights in my eyes. So wave vigorously. We've got two mic handlers at either side of the room. Um, we've got some great clips for you. But if, uh, if you've got a particular point uh, during the proceedings you want to ask questions, then just go for it. So we're going to start by seeing Kenton's showreel so you kind of know uh, the territory he's in. So let's have a look. Hello, Bambinos. Hello, Hello, Dad. Can't wait to meet your lovely girls. Pleasure to meet you both. Hi. Hello. Martin, you're not the Prime Minister. Go and do something. <laughs> Jewish blessings upon you. Yes. Hello. The very big night. And that's our mum and dad. Shit on it. You ready to go home? Wow. I've changed, truly. I don't trust a word you say. Look. That's a lie. He's like an angel. They thought you were Satan. We're gonna reel him in and gut him. Like a fish. You didn't need to add that. The endorphins are racing around my body like ants in tiny cars. It's genius. Mad genius. All rise. Attention. I'll be back momentarily. Dear Lord. Play makes sense. Mike, this is Will, my hot young pupil. You're gonna be embarrassed today. Oh, yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> do not underestimate what I will do to get this job. He is very guilty. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about being a criminal barrister, Will. You do meet criminals. The defense is that the dress cutting is a habitual thing with no sexual intent. Oh, that's ridiculous. With a defendant. Oh, shit. Horace, wait! No, no, I have to go back. We're coming for you, Horace! We're in 1958. No! Why are we never taken to a decade where black people are like? I know why we're in the 50s. This is just time. Are we really going to do this shit again? We need to just think bigger. Really? How do you mean? You go first. No, 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 you go, you go. <sighs> it's a surprise. A toast to Jenny. Welcome back to the land of the living. Is that tasteless? Yes. This is incredible. It's Thanks for inviting us, Pauline. Ah, oh, here's the birthday boy. <laughs> Welcome to our little home for oh, the week. Shoes. Yeah, what's this doing in here? I didn't know if they'd have one. That's quite a chandelier. Yeah, I was thinking I might nick it and put it in my house. It would fit right in. I think this is going to be an interesting week. <laughs> so, fantastic programmes, but I'm going to start with a really broad question uh, and ask, what exactly is your job, Kenton? Good question, um, Helen. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I do know. Um, well, I suppose I am a producer. Um, so what does that mean? And that can mean all sorts of things, um, depending on what sort of shows you are making. But fundamentally, I think it means that I um, 
now an executive producer, so we have a production company, we make lots of shows and work with lots of people. But fundamentally, a producer is the person that is sort of first in and last out on any show. So you're the person, the mad person that goes, oh, I think that book would make a good TV show or a good film, or I think that um, writer that I met at that RTS event is quite talented and I think they could, you could get, maybe get their show on TV or I think that actor I spotted at Edinburgh Festival is really good, all that stand-up comedian's interesting, has got something original to say. So you're sort of the person, you're the mad person that thinks you can get something on the television and then, uh, then you try and put it all together. So you try and find the person you want to work with and who, who's much more talented than you but who you think you can help and you raise the money and then you um, pull all the crew together and then you make the show and then, and then you, the person that deals with the problems when the thing goes wrong, um, and then you're there for all the post-production and then you're there when the budget goes wrong um, <laughs> and you're there right to the bitter end, you know, literally till the show's on air. And then you're managing the shows that goes out on TV and across the press and publicity. And then you're trying to get the show recommissioned. So you talk to the broadcasters again about, can we have another series, please? So you're sort of the, the custodian, I guess, of other people's um, creative endeavors and ambitions. And you're sort of there trying to push the project up the hill and, and keep everybody together and everybody sort of sailing or marching in the, in the same direction. If you ask my daughter what I am, she just says I'm the CEO of the patriarchy, <laughs> which I don't think is a compliment. I think it's not. It's not, no, no. So let's go back, let's wind the clock back, because your first passion was music. Yeah, it's quite interesting, actually. Music, there's quite a, there's quite, um, a common thread in, uh, I've noticed over the years, in lots of, particularly in comedy, lots of comedy writers and performers are quite, are, are quite or very musical. And I, I don't know if that's because there's a, there's a rhythm to comedy and there's a, you know, obviously there's a rhythm to music, but there's something about the rhythm of comedy is quite musical when it's right. So yeah, I started out um, um, wanting to be a record producer. Um, I went to a um, uh, sort of average um, comprehensive school, state school in, the mid in Birmingham. <laughs> And then was quite good at music, um, and I went to a not very good sixth form college, um, where I sort of didn't do very well, but sort of got sidetracked into music. And um, this chap used to teach, used to come and teach me the saxophone, because that's what I played. And um, he he said to me, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I want to be Tony Visconti." You're all too young to know who Tony Visconti is, but do you know who Tony Visconti is? He produced all the David Bowie albums, so he was a massive, really brilliant producer in the 70s. Anyway, I said I wanted to be Tony Visconti, like some bloke from Birmingham can be Tony Visconti. And he said, oh, that's quite interesting. So at that point, there were three things you could do. You could um, go down to London and knock on all the doors of recording studios and sort of see if you can get a job as a runner or a tape op. Or um, there was one degree course, which was a ton, called a Tonmeister course at Thurrell University, which you had to be a maths genius and a physics genius and a kind of science genius to get on. It was the only sort of degree course in, in sound engineering, and I was too stupid to get on that. Uh, and he said there's this thing called the BBC that um, will take you on and, and train you. So I... I applied to go to Coventry Polytechnic to do electrical engineering. Do you know what Polytechnic is? It's like a shit university. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have them anymore. But anyway, I, I had a place at Coventry Polytechnic to do electrical engineering, and I also applied to the BBC and got, a, a, um, got taken on as a, tra a trainee studio manager when I was 18. So I didn't go to university, um, which is quite unusual. I discover now in the, in the media. Everybody seems to have gone to university. I didn't, I went straight from um, A-levels to uh, getting a job at the, at the BBC as a trainee studio manager. And you ended up at Radio Nottingham. Yeah. And, and, and what, what did that pathway teach you? What did you take from that that you begin to build a career on? Well, I think, what, I think the first thing it uh, taught me is, um, it's a bit like Graham was saying earlier about sort of just talking to people and being open to 
people and making relationships. And that, you know, the old saying is, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And it's certainly, you, it's certainly true that you, you do need to know lots and lots of things, but you also you need to have lots and lots of contacts. So I was, um, when you're a trainee studio manager, you worked in sound across uh, radio, television, film, and that could, so that was Monday, I'd be doing, a, I'd be the sort of tape off on a Radio 1 session, and then on Tuesday, you'd be uh, in a dubbing suite, dubbing Top Gear, or, or um, you know, wherever was being made at the time. On Wednesday, you'd be the boom up on, on, a, on a drama show. Uh, and on Thursday, I was editing a documentary, and in those days, we were doing this, because this is editing back before there was digital things, so you have quarter-inch tape, and you'd, um, I was cutting a documentary series with a chap called Jock Gallagher, who was the head of uh, regional radio. And so you'd, you'd, you'd cut the quarter-inch tape and take a bit of it out, hang it around your neck, and then you'd join that bit of the interview up, and then you go, I think this bit is around your neck. Would it be better if we put it there, in terms of the storytelling of this particular part of this documentary? Uh, and he said, oh, you've got quite a good um, editorial brain. Have you ever thought about being a producer? And I went, no. I was thinking about going to the pub after this. <laughs> Um, and he, so he sort of arranged me to go to Radio Nottingham to be a sort of trainee producer. Um, God knows why, but he did. He, he, you know, he sort of did what I sort of do now, which is try and spot talent in people and then try and um, create a, a path for it to, to progress. So what was the question? <laughs> It was how did you get to where you are now? Oh, well, the question, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so then I went to Radio Nottingham and then I, um, I wasn't very good. Um, but I met a lot of people. Um, and I was then in, in, properly in the BBC and being paid, I think I was paid £4,779 a year um, by the BBC. And... Um, the great thing about getting into a big organisation is you can, there's lots of places you can, people you can talk to and opportunities. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, you know, I still sort of wanted to be a record producer, but was working at the BBC and was kind of doing stuff on the side with bands and local recording studios and all of that. Um, but I'd also, always also really liked comedy. Uh, my dad used to listen to The Goon Show tapes, we had the books in the house, I used to read all those. Um, so there's one radio show called Loose Ends, which was a huge show at the time on Radio 4. It was a, a very innovative um, sort of um, talk show and did lots of interesting things, cut up things with taped interviews and, and just kind of experimental, smart, funny, modern. There was lots of young people on it um, uh, working as reporters. So anyway, I, while I was at the BBC, I applied for a, another trainee job on that show. And um, at the same time, because of my desire to work in music, in the music industry, I applied for a, a, a trainee job at Radio 1. And because the BBC is enormous, um, nobody noticed that I'd applied for these two jobs at the same time. And, and so then I got offered both the jobs at the same time. And because the BBC is enormous, nobody noticed. So I had to go, oh, you've offered me this job over here and this job over here. So I ended up going to... Um, uh, London and doing a year and a half at Radio 4 and then going to Radio 1. Um, but the, there's a chap I met at Radio uh, Nottingham, a chap called John Simons, whose mate was running Radio 1. And I'm now told, in retrospect, that I didn't do a very good job of, of the interview at Radio 1. In fact, they thought I was a bit of an idiot. But uh, whoever it was saw something and then checked me out with John, who I was working with. So that relationship led to that job, if you like. Being nervous, looking a bit nervous today, being nervous in the interview. If you've got other people around you, people, people will phone up and check you out and ask other people about yeah. what you're like. And yeah. he seemed a bit nervous on the day. What's he like to you know? He's, he's a good guy, give him a give So him a break. that led to a huge gig with Jonathan Ross, oh. producing I think you said 338 chat shows. Well, I was, when I was at Radio One, I um, um, phoned Jonathan Ross up and said, "You should be, you should be on the radio." He'd never done a radio show, so we did 13. We did a show called uh, Jonathan Ross Live with Ronnie Scotts. So we did 13 weeks live 
from Ronnie Scott's a sort of music and chat show, which seemed to go quite well. And because um, it was on at six o'clock in in uh, Soho, so lots of industry people would come down to it. And it was you know it was a kind of nice thing to do at the end of the week. And I produced it. And at the end of it, Jonathan said, "I'm doing a TV show, uh, a new live uh, talk show, three times a week on Channel Four. Would you like to be one of the producers?" And I said, no, I wouldn't. I am a radio man. Radio is where it's at. Um, I'm going to stay in radio, thank you very much. Don't want TV's too complicated, too many people. I like the purity of radio and the kind of, it's just me and a couple of other people. And it's a much purer creative um, endeavor. And then he told me how much he'd pay me. And I went, yes, I definitely think I'm a TV man. <laughs> TV's much better for me. That's always what I've always wanted to do. <laughs> Let's go into TV. <laughs> Um, all of those things are true. Radio is a much purer creative um, environment. If you want to produce, it's, you, you're much close to the action. Yeah. A bit like podcasts, and you know, podcasts are the sort of same as radio. You can get much close, uh, much up more up close and personal with the with the writers and the presenters and the actors in radio than you can in these enormous beasts of of television. So. I would recommend people don't rule out looking at radio as a way into the industry. Because uh, you, you, can, you can get producing or making things much quicker than you can in TV, and it's an interesting route in. And a, lot, a lot of very successful comedy producers have come through that radio route. Let's skip forward a few years and, and talk about one of your great relationships with the writer and how you work with him. I'm talking about Carolyn Hearn. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how you met her, how you began working together. Okay. Is this interesting, by the way? Are you enjoying this? Okay. Um, good. If, it's, if it gets boring, just put your hand up and say, this bit's boring, and then we move on. Um, uh, so I was, um, so worked with Jonathan Ross and made 350-odd episodes of his chat show and then made a, a show which was called Saturday Zoo, which was supposed to be like Saturday Night Live, but it wasn't really. It was. It was. You know. It was great fun. I had great fun making it. Met lots of people. Steve Coogan did his uh, one of his first characters on there. Met lots of writers, and it was all good fun. But it didn't really work as a as a show. I learned a lot. Had a great time. But the show was a sort of um, not not really a hit. And then I. It was quite hard to get a job after that. The saying is, "You're only as good as your last show," uh, and the last show wasn't. Particularly um, remarkable. So I was sort of out of work for a bit, um, sort of, you know, a bit worried about what was next. I think I was 25, 26, so it was a slightly scary time. Anyway, um, one of the people that used to come down to um, Ronnie Scott's is a chap called Andy Harris, um, who um, had made a show called The Incredibly Strange Film Show with Jonathan. Which is, if you you should check it out, it's a really good documentary series about um, sort of brilliant European and, and, and American film directors. I'm just going to interject and tell you who Andy Harris is. Oh, Andy, yeah, Harris, Andy. Andy Harris uh, runs a production company called Left Bank Pictures, but they make The Crown. So again, one of the luminaries of our industry. Yeah, so Andy, who is much older than me, um, <laughs> much older, uh, like incredibly old now. <laughs> um, he rang me up and said, uh, do you want, you know, I'd, so I met him at, at um, these, these Ronnie Scott shows and then he'd worked with Jonathan, so I got to know him a bit. Uh, and then he, he offered me a job to go up to Manchester um, to work at Granada Television in Manchester uh, to make some entertainment shows, which is not I didn't really want to do, but I didn't really have an option at that point. I really needed a job. And Manchester's so good Manchester's for you. Manchester's fantastic. Um, and I'm from Birmingham, so I could drive past my parents and wave at them <laughs> and then go on up to Manchester. Uh, so I went to Manchester and uh, I made some entertainment shows and the, like all, the, you know, the, the Granada at the time was this fantastic kind of melting pot of all sorts of interesting um, creative people and writers and directors and um, actors and all sorts of things. And... Um, used to get the train back every Friday night to London and used to sit with uh, Craig Cash and Henry Normal and Carolina Hearn 
uh, who were working on a show called The Mrs. Merton Show. Um, and so we used to hang out and chat and, you know... Um, drink. Drink a little bit <laughs> on the train down. We sort of got to know each other yeah. um, over a period of about a year. Um, and then Caroline asked me to produce the Mrs. Merton show towards the end of its uh, life. And then uh, she, Andy and she asked me to produce the Royal Family when they'd made one series, I think, and then I came onto it for a, a second, the second, third, and fourth series. So we've got a clip of the Royal Family coming up, but before we roll the clip, just explain what the premise of the Royal Family is. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Oh, yeah, so the royal family, it's, a, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, um, it's all set in one room. Um, it's, a f it's a Mancunian family, a uh, sort of nuclear family of mum, dad, um, s uh, daughter and younger brother, and they sit around and watch TV. Um, Gogglebox ripped it off, basically. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a show about family and, and um, relationships and parenting and... Um, and you know, sort of, it's sort of Caroline and Craig's take on what their uh, view of family life is, um, and, and it became a massive hit, huge hit. It moved, started on BBC Two, moved to BBC One. Um, the clip we're going to show is from a, is from an episode that went out on Christmas Day, God knows when, but got sort of 12, 13 million viewers, which was you know is huge in those in in that day and age. Um, so just to set it up. So the, the, so the reason yeah. I chose this clip is because um, um, when you're trying to make sc uh, scripted programs, there's an awful lot of pressure on getting the script ready before you shoot. And that's the huge focus. It's everything is driven by the script. Um, but one of, I think one of the geniuses of the Royal Family and of Caroline, who was inherently quite a um, lazy person, and that she didn't want to. She'd made sketch shows and had been on lots of shoots where you're charging around all, all the time. So she basically devised a comedy where she could sit on a sofa all day, pretty much, and not have to get up and move around and keep it as simple as possible so that the characters and the, and the comedy and the writing can, it can be about that and not be about stunts and car crashes and people falling yeah. over and all that sort of stuff. It's Shall a we very, very just simple just set format. up the clip, watch the clip, and then you can explain exactly how you came to put this together. OK. So, so the, the, the clip involves Dad and his daughter, who is pregnant. Um, so shall we have a look, please? Definitely sure it wasn't just a great big piss, love. No, I know it wasn't. But I don't know what I'm gonna do. And Dave's gonna miss it. And he's supposed to be helping me with my breathing. And he's supposed to be counting them things. He was supposed to be counting them, them things while I'm having. God, I'm so scared. And I, I don't even think I want the baby anymore. And I don't think Dave wants it either. He didn't even want to feel like kicking before. And I bet you, he'll leave it all to me. And I don't even know anything about babies. You'd be all right. There's nothing to it. doesn't like me. What if I don't like the baby? Of course you'll like it. You'll love it. How do you remember the first time your mum... When your mum put, put you in my arm and I looked at you? Oh, God, you were beautiful and I knew. I, I knew then. I'd do anything for you. 
anything for you and our Anthony. What? I'm not good enough. Like me now. You'll be a wonderful mother. Dad, if Dave doesn't come back, will you come with me to the hospital? Of course I will. I'll be right there, outside. But your mum will be inside with you. You promise you will, Dad? You will stay with me? <laughs> of course I'll stay with you. I'll always be there for you. Yeah. Always. Hey, Denise. I'm going to be a granddad. <laughs> Not very funny, is it? <laughs> I think bittersweet is the word. Yeah. Because well, the reason, the reason why people, I, people knew the characters, though, yeah, didn't they? They knew the characters. It was the middle of the Christmas uh, special, and the and the reason why I uh, chose it is because um, that that was that was shot in one take at the end of a day when nothing had been shot for various reasons. There was no script. The script wasn't available for that day. There were various issues going on, on the set, and. Um, we ended up turning over at, I think, quarter past six uh, when you, and the studio, you know, the crew were finishing at seven, so that was shot in one take. We've, there's only ever one take of that performance. So it's just an example of how sometimes you've got to let, relax about the process sometimes and not just keep shooting. If, there's n if what is there to be shot is not any good, sometimes you're better off relaxing and letting a, a different creative process take place. So that bit of TV gold happened out of absolute chaos and panic and you know, almost having a whole day of not shooting anything. And then you get, well, it's about the two minute scene of absolute you know, bliss. Um, it's probably therapy actually, the reason I showed it to you, because it was quite a stressful day. Then we got that. You, you describe working with Caroline, um, sometimes she wouldn't be writing. You'd be there on your laptop. You no, know, they didn't. They, Karen Craig didn't, didn't write. They yeah. would, they would um, you'd sit in a room with them and they would, they would sort of improvise dialogue and you'd scribble it down um, quickly on a piece of paper and then they would go and have a cup of coffee and a fag and then you'd quickly type it up and print it out and they'd come back in half an hour later, read it out. Um, then you make, they'd give you some notes, you make some tweaks, they go and have another cup of coffee. And that was the process over the course of about uh, three or four months of writing the royal family. So it was like sitting and having a sort of comedy masterclass, uh, a proper comedy ma masterclass about how to write. And writing isn't just typing; it's it's a lot of a lot of Carol and Craig stuff. It was channeling things they'd heard on the top of a bus, or things that their parents had said, or things that their dad had said, or things that their next door neighbour had said. So it's kind of rem almost like um, it's channeling all of this stuff of life that they'd collected and were sparring off each other and remembering and reminding people the stories about people and then channeling that into these characters. So it's fair to say that you took that experience and, and understood what it was to make comedy and that, that took you in a different direction from doing the chat shows, uh, yeah. the kind of the shiny floor shows, that sort of thing. Um, we're going to move on to another one of your amazing shows, which ran series after series, mm. and you discovered a writer called Robert Popper. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I didn't discover Robert. Robert was extremely um, well known. He'd been a commissioning editor at, uh, at Channel 4, and he'd made a brilliant series of short um, films, I guess, short programs called Look Around You, which you should check out if you don't know them. They're, they're fantastic sort of parodies of, of 70s um, educational films. Um, 
But um, when I, I, so I went to the BBC and left the BBC to, um, to, start, to um, join Big Talk Productions, uh, and I phoned him up and said, what are you doing? Because um, I sort of heard that he had written something. Um, and he said, yeah, I've written this show um, about um, uh, people who have dinner on a Friday night, like two sons go back to see their uh, parents, sort of based on him and his brother Johnny's um, experiences. And I said, that, oh, that sounds really good. Can I read it? Uh, so he sent it to me, and it was really good. And he would, he'd been working with Caroline Leddy, who another, was another Channel 4 commissioner, who I think had commissioned the original script but then left. So the three of us were sort of working together on it. Um, and I suppose that, from that point to shooting like a 10-minute taster tape to getting on the show on air was about two years, I guess, to get it commissioned and to get him to write it and to get it cast. And then the first series went out in 20... 11, I think, and then it just, it was one of those great things, it just kept finding an audience and growing and the, the characters developed over the course of six seasons and um, it sort of became a big thing, the thing you dream of, which is a proper big comedy hit where you've got students dressing up as Jim and, and um, everybody shouting uh, Shalom Jackie at, at um, Tamsin <laughs> Greg, wherever she goes, which drives her in the show. We're talking about is Friday night dinner. Friday night dinner, dinner of course. I forgot to say Friday night yeah. dinner. Well, if it sort of said Shalom Jackie, you all knew. <laughs> so it turned into that thing, a hit. Yeah. And, and the, all those catchphrases that are in it were not meant as catchphrases, they're things that the audience adopted. And the, we went, oh, look, everybody's saying shit on it, or Shalom Jackie, or all those people making t shirts and sticking them on Instagram. And, and uh, so it just became this. This sort of phenomena. And when you saw that first script, I mean, if you obviously, yes. could you envisage it was going to take off in the way that it did? No, of course not. No. No. No, no idea. So can you see it in the words? Or I is it a feeling? No. Or? Well, I think you just think what you can, well, you believe in the person. Yes. You believe in Robert, who's brilliantly funny and had, a, had an ab original take on a family show. So you go, well, this family shows work uh, and have worked forever. Um, been involved in a couple, but there's all sorts of family shows. This is a new way of doing a family show. It's not, the, it's not very high concept. The concept is two boys go around to see their um, parents for Shabbat dinner on a Friday night. And, the un and what it's really about is why is it whenever anybody goes back to see their parents, however old you are, they press a button in you and you reduce to your 14-year-old self. You know, it happens to me for 50 years, oh, I'm going to see my parents, I become a sulky teenager. It's just weird. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but it happens to all of us. Um, so that's what I believed in. I believed in Robert. And then you start a attracting a cast to it and they sort of see potential in the characters. And then it slowly builds. Often it's the disaster, it's terrible. We've all been involved in shows that don't work for whatever reason. But fundamentally, you believe in the writer and the story or the, 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 the thing they want. They've got something to say about something. It's not just jokes. Of course, you need jokes, but it's also it's about something and it's a fresh take on something. And it was a slice of family life that we hadn't really seen before. Yeah. Who decides what's funny and what is... Uh, the audience. Right. Yeah. Right, so until you actually get that show on air and you sense the reaction. Yeah, I mean, we know, that's, uh, the, the ultimate judge is the audience. You're just trying to use your skill and judgment in terms of what makes you laugh and what, and hopefully you'll work with people where you've got a shared sense of humour. If you haven't got a shared sense of humour, please don't work together because it's going to be a disaster. But the ultimate arbiters are the audience. You can just do your best your best guess at what is funny based on experience and, and uh, taste. And, you know, there's lots of comedies I don't like. I don't think they're very funny. But that's funny is a very particular thing. It's, there's an old saying that a new, a new sitcom is a bit like a new... It's a bit like you've lived in your house for years and you've, your next-door neighbours you love. They've been, you know, they're your mates. You've grown up with them. You know them incredibly well. You know all their fo foibles, all their nuances. And then one day they sell their house and move and um, a new family move in, 
and you hate them. You don't know them, you think their jokes are shit, they're annoying, they're irritating. That is very much like a new comedy comes along. New comedy comes along and you're like, who are these people? Why, are they, why is this supposed to be funny? This isn't funny at all, I hate this. And that's often audiences' reactions to new comedy. And as you get to know, hopefully as you get to know the characters and get to know the people and what drives them, what their hopes and fears are and neuroses are and all those things, then you start to understand their sense of humour so that your new next door neighbours then suddenly, three years later, they're your new best friends. You can't believe you ever didn't like them because you now know them. And so that's what a show is like. So that's what Friday Night Dinner was like, I guess. It came along as a new show. And as people got to know the characters, it grew and grew and grew and grew, and then people really liked it and really wanted to spend more time with them. Should we have a look at the clip and then talk about the sequence? This afterwards? is a clip from the, um, the last series, and I don't know why we chose this, it just makes me laugh. Uh, Dad has um, messed with the dinner in a very silly and unfortunate way. No, it's not females. Now, listen. If it's about wearing a sheath again, well, I'm sorry, but... There's glass in the soup. What? There's what? Shh, I don't want your bloody mother to know. There's some glass in the soup, all right? All right? Glass, glass in the soup? What are you talking about? Well, you know what glass is. Yes. And you know what soup is. Dad. <gasps> well, one of them is in the other. How? Why? <sighs> your mum asked me to stir the soup. Her first error. And then I accidentally smashed the bulb in the extractor fan thing above the pot and it sort of... Exploded right into the soup. Oh, you're such a bloody idiot! Shut up! Ow! OK, so there's glass in the soup and you want us not to tell mum, despite the fact that if she drinks any, she's going straight to hospital. Yeah, should I call the ambulance now or...? She's not going to hospital, stupid babies. Just don't say a bloody word or she'll chop my sodding hands off. But, Dad! And you better not tell your birds. Oh, we're definitely telling our birds. What? Why? Why? So they don't end up in intensive care. Yeah, next to Mum. Nothing's going to happen. I sieved most of the stuff. Most of it? Yeah, and I picked out the main shards. Oh, good. So the main shards of glass are gone. What about the less main shards of glass? Yeah, the ones that only pierce the less main organs when swallowed. You know, like the esophagus or the spleen. Dad! What are you doing in there? Hello, my sweet. What are you all doing? It's rude. Uh, just having a, uh, you know, man-to-man -man chat. Oh, I see. Won't be long, love. <laughs> They're lovely girls! <laughs> and yet, only five minutes later, she was tearing at her throat in agony. Burke, so don't say a bloody word, OK? It had to be tonight, didn't it? Oh, stop fussing! Bit of glass, never did anyone any harm. Ah. What? Just drink from the side of the bowl. Don't touch anything on the bottom. Maybe we can all get back to our meal then, eh? Yeah. Ah! <sighs> Are you all right, Martin? Oh, I son suddenly feel all dizzy. I... Oh. Martin? Yeah. Um, what are you doing? So terribly dizzy. Uh... Oh, my God. Why did you do that? Huh? You just pulled all my soup away. Did I? I... I don't remember. OK, just give me your suit, will you, and stop mucking about. <coughs> Martin! <coughs> I am sorry, girls. That's OK. Well, come on, then. Oh, dizzy again. Oh, my God. <coughs> oh! 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 Dad! Oh! Jesus! Martin! Burning! Burning! <coughs> oh! No! oh, that's better. <sighs> <laughs> so it's a mix of character, clever writing, but also slapstick. Tell us a bit where that comes in. Uh, what slapstick? Yeah, well, it's, just, it's in the script. So Robert writes it, and then the actors make it better. Um, it's interesting that, going back to talking about music, the rhythm, just thinking about the rhythm of that scene, it's, they, Robert's only note really ever to the actors is do it faster, because it really goes on at, at a pace, and it's got quite a, you know, you can sort of yeah. count four, four to the bar to it, because it's really running on this kind of musical rhythm. Um, and Robert, write, you know, Robert wrote all the slapstick in there, and, and working with a with an actor like Paul Ritter and, the, and Tamsin, but particularly Paul, who's sadly no longer with us, he is one of those actors who would just commit to it and go for it and will do the most ludicrous things 
with enormous conviction and and um, and fun and kind of um, and chutzpah. So it sort of doesn't feel like slapstick. It feels like that's Ma Ma Martin's a lunatic. Yes. He will do the maddest thing to get himself out of trouble. So it just it comes from wanting to make a silly, funny show. But that was all on the page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it was completely envisaged beforehand. There was no improvisation. So unlike Caroline Ahern. No, no, that's yeah. absolutely written to yes. the T. And yeah. there are, you know, with that in that scene, for example, I mean, a they're having to eat dinner um, for three days back to back. So there are spit buckets everywhere because you can't eat dinner for three days back to back. For the for the bowl pool, uh, the suit going on pool, there are seven shirts, seven ties, seven jackets. Because um, every time you do that, if you haven't got it perfect, you've got to do it again. So you've got another costume to bring in. You can't make that stuff up. It's got yeah. to, you have to plan it um, you know, forensically because it's, cause as soon as you do that, you've got, you've got shit everywhere. <laughs> and you've got to get it right. And you can, uh, I think we, we probably would have two or three attempts at it. So you'd have three jackets, three shirts, three ties. Depending on where it went, you have to completely take off the tablecloth and reset the table. So it's quite a laborious, long process to get that one joke. Yeah. So they have to be written and planned and, and precisely executed, otherwise chaos. Yeah. Made. And do you get to be on set much? Me? Yes. They let me. Yeah. They let you. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think it's... Um, I do go on set to go and see how everybody is, but I think it's quite... And I watch rushes. Um, but I try, it's actually quite useful to be slightly distant from it so that if anything, if there's a problem or somebody wants you to look at something, you haven't been you know, there all the time. Because if you're there all the time, you're not a fresh pair of eyes on a situation or mm. with, a, with a... You haven't got all the baggage of the last... 20 days of shooting, you're coming yeah. in with a slightly fresher perspective and maybe with a, with a, a more neutral um, approach to whatever an issue might be or what problems they're, they're, they're facing. So it's good to be slightly, not removed, but um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More objective. More objective, good. Be more objective. Yeah. But you are watching all the rushes and obviously you've been in all the castings, you've watched all the castings, you've uh, been in endless script meetings with Robert, you have looked at all the set design, the costume design before you started shooting, and you've been across recruiting the DOP and the sound recorders and the makeup design and all of that. Um, and then you are watching, then you go to the read through, and then you do another set of notes based on the read through. So when it comes to shooting, I think it's good just to slightly sit back from it, because what's important is when you get into the edit, Again, when Robert and who, and and Martin, as the director, are kind of being here with it, sometimes you can't see what you've got, and you, and it's useful to have a fresh pair of eyes come and look at your work because you'll see it in a different way. Yeah. Are there any questions at this stage? Brilliant. No or questions. Shall, oh. oh, there's a question. <laughs> Can we wait till the mic gets to you, please? <laughs> No, if you'd like to tell us where you're from, that would be great. Um, my name's Jess. I'm from Scotland. My accent may give that away. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> um, just out of curiosity, how many pages would you say you shoot a day on something like Friday? Really good question. I mean, that's a um, really good question. Uh, on, we're, we're doing a new show with Robert at the moment called I Hate You for Channel 4, and they are shooting eight to nine pages a day, which is really enormous. Um, and that's sort of driven by how much money we've got and how long the schedule is. It's a seven, six-week schedule, I think. Um, on dramas, depending on how ambitious they are, so on something you're going to see later on, The Outlaws, that would, be sh that would shoot two to three pages a day. But that's quite a big, complicated, multi-location show. Um, on comedies, you, we'd hope to shoot about six pages a day. Um, two's a real luxury. Drama have got more money than comedy, so they get to shoot more, more, more uh, slowly. But yeah. And then I guess following that for schedules or something like, just using Friday night dinner as an example, because I've seen that. Yeah. What would be your length for a shooting schedule, roughly? 
when you're getting into production? Well, how many days? Yeah, would you, is that like a six week process for the whole series? Yeah, you'd be, yes, you, it'd be about five days an episode. Based on if you're, so the episodes are about 25 minutes long. So you can shoot, if you're shooting five or six pages a day, that's a yeah. roughly five minutes a day. You want to shoot a bit more so you can throw stuff away. So yeah, a, it would be a 30, a 30 day schedule for a six by 30 comedy. Based on, based on you can shoot five minutes a day. It's all maths, you know, it all comes down to the mastery. What, what, how much money have you got? How much time does that give you? And then how many pages have you got to shoot? And then how does that all go into schedule? And if you haven't got enough money, you've got too much to shoot and then it all becomes a nightmare. Okay. That's a good question, wasn't it? It's very Any more questions question. like that about the practicalities? We'll just take the one there before we move on because I do want to get to the last clip. So middle of the row. Hello, uh, Tom from London Met, uh, Movie Production. Uh, from where you uh, take uh, ideas for uh, your scripts? Where do you get your ideas um, for scripts? The combination of things, it's either um, um, stories that people want to tell, that's probably the best place, meeting writers, talking to them about what they, what they want to do um, rather than what I want to do. I'm more interested in, in enabling other people to tell their stories or books you've read or magazine articles or something you heard on the radio or some story somebody told you. Um, but the perfect way is to find writers that you uh, like and respect and enjoy their writing and, and, and work out what they want to do. Yeah, yeah, I know from my experience that writing is uh, from one side uh, hard, but uh, you can enjoy it uh, when you're writing because uh, I write uh, scripts, uh, novels, so uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate uh, when uh, someone, someone uh, is uh, writing and enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can often, we? often, also, the last thing you should say to a writer is, what do you want to do? Because often, if they're often doing it, so often with, with higher profile writers, often if you've got a book that you think they'd be great for, you can, you can attract their attention by going, we've optioned this book and we think you would really enjoy adapting it. Um, because most writers who are any good have already got their idea. They don't want you to come and say, what's your idea? Okay, well, what's your idea for me? Which leads us neatly on to uh, the last clip we're going to see, and this is your new show called yeah, The Outlaws. Yeah, it's called The Outlaws. It's, um, it's uh, created by Stephen Merchant, uh, uh, who uh, co-wrote The Office, and Elgin James, who is a, uh, 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 wrote The Mayans, which is a, a show about... Um, about gangs in Los Angeles. Stephen has never been in a gang. Elgin James was in a gang, did time, I think they called it, in a federal penitentiary, and they came together to create the show about uh, community service in Bristol, which Stephen's parents used to do. So when he was growing up, his mum and dad ran community service, so he used to hear all these stories about people being sent to do 180 hours of painting a disused warehouse because they'd um, stolen a car or been naughty. Let's so he brings seven different characters together in the community service. Let's uh, see the clip. Hi there. I'm Greg. I'm six foot seven inches tall. And no, it's not in proportion. If it was in proportion, I'd be eight foot three. <laughs> Greetings and felicitations. Hi, Pockets. What's thick and chicken? Uh, it's finger licking chicken. Good morning, ladies. Can I just say, you're both looking beautiful. No, you can't. He can't tell you that you're beautiful? We didn't ask him for a verdict on our appearance. Sorry, but I said I got find it, ladies. You both right couple of swooners. Attention! Sit. Some people think that community payback is an easy option. 
a soft touch. Newsflash, it ain't. You will repay your debt to society by working the number of hours mandated by the court. My name is Diane Pemberley. I'm your supervisor. And I could be a good guy or a mean bastard. Your choice. Good guy, please. You don't choose. You said it was our choice. It was a figure of speech. It wasn't entirely clear. Are you a troublemaker? No, no. Definitely, definitely not. When I call your name, say here. John Halloran. Here. Shouldn't be. Frank Sheldon. What's the agenda, Brenda? Christian Taylor. Yo. OK, what are you people not getting? Just say here. Murder O'Kiki. Here in body, not in spirit. I don't even know what that means. Gregory Dillard. Yeah, that's me. Can I just apologise for the inappropriate joke earlier about things being in proportion? To be honest, it's not even that long. Although it is quite flat, like a kipper. Just say here. Yeah, here, yeah, here. Rani Rakowski? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How is it doing as a matter of interest? It's doing, really, it's doing quite well. Yeah. Yeah, it's episode two. This is one of the shop shows that's playing on uh, mm. Monday nights, BBC One, yeah, yeah, 9 o'clock. Right. Yeah, it's episode two went out um, this week. Episode yep. three is now on iPlayer. Episode three goes up Monday. It's doing all right. I mean, it's sort of, it's interesting these days because we used to be obsessed with the overnight ratings. Yeah. And um, basically only old people watch live television. So... Uh, um, so the overnight ratings are a, a gross kind of distortion of who's actually watching your show. Yeah. So I think it's now, it's up, we're up to about six million views, I think, the combination of, of uh, catch up and live and it's the, you know, critics seem to like it, so you mixed reaction to it. And like any new comedy, comedy drama, it will get a mixed reaction because people are trying to get to know the show and understand the tone. But yeah, it's all right, I think. How long did it take from you talking to Stephen Merchant about the idea to getting it onto the screen? Um, uh, four or five years. Right. He, I was introduced to him um, by uh, uh, his agents, and we share an agent, and he, I met him, um, and he'd written an American version of it, which I, I read. Um, I then had breakfast with him and said, it's really good, I think it's great, and if you ever felt, thought about doing a, a, sh uh, a version set in the UK, I'd be really interested in, like, please let me do it with you. <laughs> Um, and then I think he tried to set it up in, in the States, the American version, and for various reasons that didn't happen. And then a couple of years later, um, he said, oh, I've written a, a British version. Um, and then we, that was the quickest ever commission. We sent that to the BBC on a Thursday, and I think they greenlit it on the following Tuesday. But then the fun and games begin because it's an expensive show. It's got Christopher Walken in it. It's got a very big cast. It's a, it's a sort of comedy. It's a crime comedy thriller. So the BBC pay for about thirty percent of the at total cost, and the rest of the money comes from uh, co-producers who are at Amazon in the states. So that took a long time to get that financing together. And working with my business partner Matthew Justice, who's a genius and helping pull those sort of things together. And the whole team at Big Talk, we managed to raise the money by finding Amazon as a co-producer and then um, started shooting. And then 11 days later, there was this thing called COVID came along. Have you heard of it? <laughs> and we had to stop shooting um, completely, just shut it down. So, you know, three years work, 11 days shooting, stop. Quite distressing for everybody for, for multiple reasons. And then in that first big lockdown, um, the BBC suggested to Stephen that he might want to write series two. And he went, yeah, that's a good idea. So he and, uh, and John Butler and the rest of the writing team wrote a second season, which the BBC then said, well, why don't we do series one and series two back to back, which we said, great. But then we had to get Amazon to agree to do that as well. Uh, and they don't normally do that. That completely goes against all of their protocols. They normally want to put the show up on, the, on Amazon see whether anybody likes it. Eventually, we got them to say yes. It was four months of sleepless nights. And then we started shooting again last whenever. Like, I can't remember. Uh, and we wrapped last Thursday the whole thing. So it's a 200, go back to your question about schedule, that was a 201-day shoot. 
incredibly complicated, multiple units, actors all over the place, all sorts of issues. Um, to shoot 12, I said 12 hours dramas in 201 days, not with the maths of that, but it's probably, it probably worked out at two or three pages a day. So that's that. That's why I look, I'm only 27, that's why I look so tired. It's and you've got another series to look forward to. So There's another series we've just, yeah, yeah. just wrapped to that. We've, I've literally, series one is now on the air uh, and is not, it's still in post-production. So we think we've completed post on four episodes. We've got two to mix and grade and dub. And then episode one of series two, I've just been sent to watch the first cut of it. And that post-production will go on until the end of March. And then we'll see what happens. So if we pop the lights up, if we've got a chance for a few quick questions. I'm also, uh, Kenton has very kindly set up an email account. So if anybody wants to get in touch, they have a brilliant idea. They fancy working for Big Talk. And by the way, Big Talk was twice voted the best place to work in telly. Um, there we go. That's how you get in touch. So, what do we got? So, can we have here in white, please? And uh, the lights. Uh, and here, here, the stripy jumper here, please. Go. Go, 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 my chance. Uh, hello, another Scotsman. Um, I guess more recently, do you find yourself having to deal with the whole arena of political correctness and never having to censor stuff that you might have wanted to say before or having to curtail things you would have... Um, wanted to get out in the, in the past, but um, or is it still as, as open as you, you'd like? Oh, that's a really massive question, isn't it? I think um, I think what's interesting on the offenders, for example, there's some, yep. the, because all of the, the characters are extremely well drawn. But when you first watch the show, uh, John, the the, um, the white businessman, he's a sort of fairly toxic what you think is a fairly toxic white man who says some pretty appalling things, but he is that what he says is 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 challenged and corrected by Myrna, the the the, the black kind of she's a she's a sort of uh, so I guess like a BLM activist protester has been in Bristol for twenty years, kind of trying to rally for black um, for black rights. So I think if in the crucible of the comedy the ideas are being challenged or, 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 are, or based in something which you can defend, then I think it's fine. But I think, you know, I think going down the, the Dave Chappelle route is not, a, not for me, wouldn't be a route I would particularly feel comfortable with because I think that is creating offence um, and, and that I'm uncomfortable with that because that seems to be punching down um, and I think you should punch up. If you're going to use comedy as a as a, uh, a device to shine a light on uh, hypocrisy or, or or whatever you whatever you think is wrong with the world and it's pointing out, then I sort of advocate of punching up and not punching down on people who are you know who don't need to have any more shit sent their way. So I don't know if that answers your question. And it, it depends on stand up. You know, stand ups have you know stand ups narrative comedy. Sketch comedy, they're all different, but I think as long as you feel like you can justify what's being said and you believe in it and think it has a, has a point, then I think it's fine. But yeah, it's much more difficult. I mean, it's much more difficult with social media now because audiences will jump on you immediately um, and completely, f you know, what's the word? Rinse you. Is that a word? Rinse. It is. Kill you. Question there. Destroy you. What? Yes. <laughs> Next question there. Um, hello, I'm Yonis, and Hi. I'm wondering, for a successful comedy show, is there a formula to it? Is there a formula to failure? Um, there is not a formula, no. The, for, the formula is, uh, is, is, is the writer, I guess. Is there a formula to failure? No, I think there's not. It's about getting great people around you, the people that you believe in, people that you have a shorthand with, uh, and really believing in what you're doing. I mean, there's many paths to failure, um, but there's not a formula. Um, Usually what goes wrong, if anything? What goes wrong? Um, 
<laughs> oh, people being nervous. Uh, I think what goes wrong is people and uh, people not making the same show. So people all thinking they're doing a different version of what is actually being made. That's when things go wrong. If you see that when you see a show, you go, "What? What's? Th what's? Th what? This is, doesn't feel like a coherent um, uh, interpretation of the script." Actors are in different, doing different things in the show. The direction seems to be, the, the director wants to, appears to want to be Ridley Scott and we needed Judd Apatow. And nobody's doing the thing that was on the page and servicing the script. So I think not having a common vision is when things go wrong, I guess. Okay, we've got two final questions here. Hi, I'm and originally then, yeah. from Bangladesh. I moved to Wales last month. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, my How's the weather? Huh? How's the weather? Oh, I, I'm, I mean, people say it's normal here, but I'm adjusting. Yeah. Winter for us is 23 degrees yeah, yeah, Celsius. Yeah. I know. I feel yeah. your pain. Thank you. Uh, my second feature film was selected at the uh, Wales International Film Festival. Yeah. And I'm stuck in the middle in this weird place where I'm very happy about the selection, but I don't know whether or not I should sell my film. I'm already in talks with a sales agent. Yeah. And, uh, or should I go down the festival route where I submit to more festivals for a better deal. I'm asking you this because even though it's not directly related with television, you're a producer, you yeah, yeah. Have clearly have buckets load of experience and I'm, I'm yeah. good this. No, I, well, I think it's only been in one festival. Yes. I would get it in all the festivals and give yourself. More festivals. Yeah, because the sales agent will still be there. Right. Um, in 12 months time or eight months time. Um, so I would, yeah, I'd explore the festival circuit a bit and get it to those audiences. And there'll be more sales agents there who okay. might offer you a better deal. I think the reason I'm personally rushing this is my part-time job right now is working at a nightclub and I bloody hate it. So <laughs> yeah. I think that's what's tempting me. Like what you said, it seems so obvious, yet I'm like, I don't want to be but a not, it's, But the money they're going to pay you is not going to... Yeah, yeah. It's not right, life-changing, right. is it's it? It's a very you're bad deal at this yeah, point. Yeah, so don't take the bad deal. Believe in your film and get it to, to audiences. And that's what you need. No, you're right. Very much appreciated. My pleasure. Final um, question. Have fun in I'm Wales. I'm really sorry we've run out of time. Final quick question. Good morning. I'm Peter Genchev from Bulgaria. From where, sorry? Bulgaria. Very um, good wine. Yeah. And, it um, is very good. Uh, how to stop running out of money? Why the book <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stop spending it. <laughs> I mean, why the productions have these problems? Why? Is there any formulas how to spend money and how to stop running out of it? I have to stop running out of it. Um, well, normally you're running out of it is if because you, you haven't budgeted the show in the right way in the first place. So normally uh, your ambition, again, what's on the page and your ambition bears no resemblance to the money you have. That's how that's how people run out of money. And there are lots of other issues to do with not shooting fast enough. The schedule dictates the budget to a certain extent because that's where the money's being spent. But it's normally, it's normally um, ambition, fantasy and reality. The, the money is a fixed element and you ain't got any more, so you've got to work out how to make that last. Because if you run out of money, you are a terrible producer and you'll be sent to producing jail. <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, <laughs> from um, all of us to not a terrible producer, can we say a huge thank you? Thank you.